We are going to spend our time of preaching and teaching in 1 Peter chapter number 2. It's part of our lectionary passage for this week, and it is the first Sunday of the month, and so we will indeed remember the Lord's sacrifice and his great love for us demonstrated through the work on the cross and take some time to affirm our faith and our connection one to another in the name of the Lord. This is a uh, very favorite passage of scripture that I've had uh, been led to through the years. And man, I've been preaching for almost 17 years here at the way pastorally. Amen. And it's so, it's so interesting because, you know, when the lectionary comes around and it's a passage, a few passages that you've preached before I preached the passage, the Acts passage is about Stephen being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Psalms 31, the, the Psalms for the day is a consistent cry out to God to save us, to deliver us from trouble. Uh, the John passage is uh, Jesus reminding the disciples to do not let your hearts be troubled. And he goes on to say that I am the way, the truth, and the life. All of these passages have at their core this consistent reminder that trouble is around us, and yet God is in the midst of us. Uh, God is with us in our troubles. God is not absent. God is not unconcerned. God is not preoccupied with other troubles and ignoring your trouble. I mean, we serve a God that is the master, uh, 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 what is it when you, when you, you be juggling things, amen, uh, he, 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 multitasker. <laughs> I had the word in my head and it just flew on out of there, amen. God is the ultimate multitasker. God can take care of your neighbor's very serious concerns and at the same time take care of yours as well. We need not act out of a sense of scarcity when it comes to God and God's power, but God's power is abundant and it is more than enough. And in the midst of the trouble we face, it is also necessary to acknowledge that Trouble can sometimes cause our hearts to melt. It can stretch our minds, our, the capacity of our faith to the point where, uh, you know, you can sometimes feel overwhelmed. You can feel as if God is absent and if, as if God is, uh, you know, on vacation. And there are moments and times, I think, in our society, in our lives, where we can indeed point to uh, a moment, a time, a situation where it feels like, God, are you asleep at the wheel? And, you know, every time one of these mass shootings happen and you see the, the lives taken of little children or elders or even, you know, middle-aged folk, you know, you start to wonder, God, uh, why are such terrible things happening over and over and over again without much reprieve? Anybody ever ask God that? Amen. It may not necessarily be a, a, a mass casualty event out there. It could be a mass casualty event in here. Anybody ever ask God, God, why do I keep having Groundhog Day about my heartbreak or Groundhog Day around my money or Groundhog, Groundhog Day around uh, my vocation. I, I feel like I've done all that I know how to do and trouble continues to find me. I mean, isn't it one thing, amen, to, to, to be someone who goes looking for trouble, but it appears or feels like another thing when trouble seems to come looking for us. Well, this passage, I think, gives you and I a very important admonition, a very important reminder about what it means to be people who have been called by God not out of trouble. Because how can you ask God to deliver you from trouble if you're not already in it? 
But God meets us in our trouble and invites us to live in and through our trouble with the power of God's spirit in a way that actually changes your trouble into goodness. God is the trouble changing God into some goodness. And so 1 Peter chapter number 2 uh, is our text today. It is likely being written to a group of Christians who are living in Rome less than 30, 40 years after the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. It is around the time when Rome is about to fall. Uh, when Rome is going through its own internal uh, combustion, its own internal implosion, if you will. And uh, I was speaking in a meeting with some important folk who always love to uh, buy into the exceptionalism of America. And I'm one of these people who don't think America is great. And I love to tell elected officials that who think it is, because they don't be one, they be trying to figure out, how did I get into this meet? And I'd be like, hey man, this collar, hey amen, you know, <laughs> gets you lots of entry into places, because y'all think I'm a chaplain for the empire, praise God, but I'm not. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Amen. I ain't no chaplain for this empire. I am a prophet of the revolution led by Jesus. And it's always important for you to always understand what your role is whenever you are in a system or a structure of domination and power. You know, it is not as if there are not records of faithful people living inside systems and structures that cause harm. Sometimes God has you there to be a prophet. Sometimes God has you there to be a priest. Sometimes God, God has you there to pastor folks. Sometimes God has you there to be a witness. Sometimes God has you there as a little leaven, a little yeast in the bread. Y'all know yeast helps bread rise. Amen. Can you imagine? I hope your influence is so powerful that you could not imagine wherever you are being as just as it could be without you being there. So we were there in this space and you know, I was just reminding them that, you know, uh, empires fall, governments fade away, but the people and the land always outlast. Presidents, emperors, governments. How I many there was a people right here on this land? We call it the Ohlone people. Long before Berserkly popped up, <laughs> rose <laughs> from the soils. There were people here who were trying to figure out what does it mean to be good stewards and faithful caretakers of creation. And in many respects, you and I, we are called to live wherever we are placed by God as a good steward over that which has been placed in our hands. You're not called to exploit, you're called to steward. You're not called to advance without a conscience, you're called to stabilize with purpose, to sustain things. Things should be better after you have come through there. So this is uh, the, the, the admonition of Peter talking to the persecuted followers of Jesus while Rome is imploding. They're trying to figure out, you know, we saw Jesus go up in the air and Jesus said, I'm coming back to receive you to myself. And some of them are still looking up in the clouds, waiting for Jesus to come back. And the writer says, listen, there is a job for you to do. There is purpose for you to exhaust. And this is what this purpose must look like. First Peter chapter number two, verse number Two, I think we'll start out. Uh, the scripture says like this, like newborn babies long for the pure spiritual milk so that it may grow into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, come to him. Somebody say, come to Jesus. A living stone, though rejected by mortals, 
yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse number six, for it stands in scripture, see I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen, somebody say chosen, and precious, somebody say precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This honor, the writer goes on to tell the readers in first century Rome, this honor then is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner. Verse number eight, and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Basically, the writer uh, is, is taking the, the Jewish scriptures, some of the prophetic words of Jeremiah and Isaiah and a few others, Haggai, and he is reminding these new followers of Jesus, many of whom have a Jewish background, that Jesus is become the cornerstone. And if you are believing in the power of Jesus' resurrection, then you yourself will not be put to shame. But if you do not believe, those who do not believe, listen to this, it does not say they are punished. It just says they do not have this honor of believing. There is a gift in you believing in the power of resurrection. There is benefit. It is an asset. It adds to your life. Verse number nine wraps it up and says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people in order that you may proclaim the excellence or the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. And I love verse number 10, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So I'm gonna talk just for a few moments uh, as we prepare for our time of communion from the topic, living stones amidst the rubble. Living stones amidst the rubble. Bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And God, I pray as I stand to preach and teach your word that you will send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word, and we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Uh, I was captivated when I read this passage more than I had been before on the words living stones. Now, as I preach this uh, passage before, I usually kind of get stuck in verse number nine, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's people. Oh, and I just, you know, I think I preached, I don't know, don't forget who you are a few times. Man, uh, you better than that, amen. Uh, 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 you know, I don't know, I, I got all kind of catchy titles. But the words that jumped out of this passage for me today or this week in study was a living stone. And I was trying to think to myself, how can a stone live? What does it mean to be a living stone? A stone, as you certainly know, uh, is not alive, at least a traditional stone. <laughs> If you saw a stone doing living type things, you would think that all kind of stimuli are running through your body. Man, you've been on a psychedelic retreat or got hold of some bad puff puff pass or you, you know, had a little too much burritos with something on it last night. You just, something has got you seeing things that aren't there. Dog got a real church in here today, amen. 
Stones aren't alive. Stones are intended to be inanimate, lifeless objects. And yet the scripture gives to you and I a contradictory arrangement of words. That Jesus is a living stone and we are called to be like Jesus, living stones. And I wonder, child of God, what would you and I really imagine wherever you're placed in life, this idea that you are a living stone. Now, of course, in the context of this passage, the living stone is set against this backdrop of God, listen, building us into a spiritual house. So we are not living stones, a part of God's activity working on us. We sing a song back in the day, says, work on me, Jesus. Y'all don't know that song. Work me over. Please work me over. Because I know when you get through, I won't be the same. Now, you know, interesting enough, you know, back in the day, we didn't have the lyrics to the song, and, you know, it was on a record, and so you just could never really make it all the way out. So people had different versions of the song, because, you know, everybody heard the song different. Well, you know, work on me, Jesus. If you work me over, I know when you get through, some folks said, I won't be ashamed. So, you know, we grew up singing the song multiple ways, depending on how you want. If I didn't want to be who I was yesterday, then I won't be the same if God works on me. If I am, you know, a bit uneasy about the trajectory of my life and I need to believe that at the end of my process, it's going to end out good, we say I won't be ashamed. But the operative thing at work in this song is God is working on us. God is working to turn that in our lives that is lifeless, that in our lives that seems without value, that in our lives that does not seem quite spectacular, God is saying that if you give me that which is lifeless, I can turn it into something that is living. And in the process of your transformation from that which is lifeless to that which is living, I will also place you in my house, in the work that I am doing in the world, in such a way that that which is inanimate is also now something that is serving a function and a purpose. A stone by itself is unspectacular. But the scripture says that Jesus has become the chief cornerstone, meaning that if you're building a building, often, you know, this is what I've been told, I'm not, you know, an artisan in this way. But that every building has to have a certain grounding to it, where everything aligns, everything fits together, everything makes sense. Jesus is the chief cornerstone, meaning that Jesus is that which helps make sense of everything. And in your life, you become a part of Jesus' sense-making work in the world. Amidst the rubble of life, God wants you to know I can place you amidst the rubble in a way that helps make sense of that which is nonsensical. I mean, it does indeed cause me to ask myself lots of questions about, God, where do you have me placed? And as I am placed in the world, are there ways that you are trying to turn my inanimate, unextraordinary or non-extraordinary life into something that is meaningful? Because the rubble is real. <laughs> Hello, somebody. I mean, you got to appreciate that as they're reading or hearing these messages, not only have they 
emerge from a people who have constantly been conquered by their enemy, but now they're living through a time where their current leaders and revolutionaries are constantly being chopped down. They're trying to figure out, God, are we as your people, are we without help? Are we abandoned? Are we left to the devices of the ubiquitous nature of death and despair? Is not that sometimes how we feel? God, I, 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 I know that you know, the preacher, the Bible study, the worship, it all is pointing me towards a promise, but all I see are unmet expectations. I know the preacher talked about resurrection a few weeks ago, but I don't know, I'm still stuck in this tomb. The angel hasn't come to roll away the stone yet. I'm still in grave clothes. I'm still in ash cloth and ashes and I continue to hear the word of God proclaiming to us that it is the power of God's activity in our lives that seeks to turn the living stone amongst the rubble as a testimony and a testament and a reminder not only that death does not have the final say, but that God meets us amidst the rubbles of our lives. Now, it's worth saying, child of God, particularly in this passage, that there is powerful language that the writer appeals to when he talks about we being people who are by God's hands being built into a spiritual house. Again, we take it for granted because we may hear it too often or too much, but the idea that the God of all creation, the forces, the ingenuity, the imagination, the power of God is literally working on you and me and our situations. That the scripture says that we are being built into a spiritual house. I want you to think about that for a second. You are a project of God. <laughs> you are a project of God. You know, when, when, when we bought our house, you know, the house looked great. You know, it had all the bells and whistles, you know, modern looking. And the longer we lived in the house, we started to realize that whoever worked on the house took some shortcuts. We couldn't tell when we bought it. Because <laughs> it looked great from the outside. But, you know, they told us that our house was sitting on a foundation. And because it's a little bit on a hill, we don't live in the hills. We live at the beginning of the incline of East Oakland. Somebody say amen. <laughs> and so the beginning of the east incline of East Oakland means that our house is sliding. Just, you know, it's, it's sliding at a pace that you can't even see it. You can't even tell. But they say it is sliding. They say all these houses living on these, they, they slide. They have to be reinforced. Now, what was fascinating about this is Looking at it with my own eyes, when he told me that, I said, now, ain't this something? The last thing I want is to be sleep. <laughs> 3 a.m. in the morning, I'm sliding off the incline of the beginning of East Oakland into the flatlands of East Oakland. It's like, Lord, have mercy. I thought I was moving on up. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in, amen. It's, I couldn't see it with my own eyes, but they said, don't worry about it because there are skilled engineers who could come in and do things to your house to stabilize it. So there's nothing wrong with your foundation, it's just the wear and tear of living on an incline. 
And this is what he told me. He said, owning a house is a lifelong endeavor. And you know what I've learned? Living <laughs> in this world is a lifelong endeavor. You can't tell what we're going through on the outside very often. But there are things that have been happening on the inside that require a skilled master builder. Someone who knows, oh, this is going to be good in a second. Someone who knows how to put you together. But listen, our doctrine of creation in the Christian tradition also says that God creates ex nihilo, which means that God creates out of nothing. So God knows how to put you together with the things you have. And God knows how to put you together with the things you don't have. Somebody said there's no lack in God. Amen. If all you got is what you have in your hand, how many know that's enough for God? But if you need a little bit more, God says, I know how to, you know, make some stuff out of nothing. So how then do we live as living stones in the midst of the rubble? The first thing, as I mentioned, with our natural homes is you got to have a good foundation. Somebody had a foundation. Now, it's so important for you to be reminded that a foundation is necessary to hold the weight of that which it is built upon or, or, or hold the weight of the house of which the house sits upon. Meaning that if you have a weak foundation, the weightiness of your house, the weightiness of your life will not be able to stand the shifts that just come from the wear and tear of life. Be clear. None of us, no matter how holy, educated, wealthy, favored, high, blessed and highly favored, huh, glory. How I many there's a shift that happens in everybody's life? You could be doing everything right. The Bible says, blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness sake. You're blessed when you do the right thing and get persecuted. How many know that the persecution still hurts? And then for some of us who get persecuted for doing the wrong thing, then we just have to pray for what? Mercy. And people, you know, I used to go stand up in court for all the young people and their friends and family. And I, they would tell me, oh, Pastor Mike, he didn't do it, he didn't do it. I would get up in there and be like, no, you know what, Mr. Judge, he did not do it. He was framed, he was. Then they showed me evidence where he, him admitting Got him on camera, <laughs> video, his own words. So after like the fifth or sixth time of, you know, always believing what they told me, I would never, you know, ask them if they did it or not. I just asked for mercy. <laughs> Why? Because all of us need mercy. If you did it, you need mercy. If you didn't do it, you needed mercy. That all of us are a people who are literally in need because of the weightiness of our life of God's mercy and your foundation. If it is not built on a rock, we call that rock Jesus. And what does it mean to have your life built on the chief cornerstone? It means that you have a way of life that resembles the values and the characteristics of the one who is building your life. Most people would like to reduce Jesus to doctrinal, theological, uh, ubiquitous kinds of ruminations about philosophy and, and essence and perichoretic Trinitarian doc, uh, 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 descriptions of the Godhead. And, and I want you to know that all that stuff is okay, but at the end of the day, my foundation is that, God, I am building my life on the life that you live. That if I can have my life built on the way in which you embody love, yeah, yeah. 
the way in which you embodied spiritual power, the practices we've talked all year about rooted in disciplines. Guess what? The practices of Jesus become the concrete that makes up your foundation. Now, it's worth saying that not every foundation is equal. And so I'm not here to bash anybody else's foundation. I'm just trying to tell you that this foundation is sure. If your life is built on the foundation of a life, listen, that beat death back, then how can we be a people who will ever be fearful of death? I mean, this is, in essence, what Peter and the early disciples were trying to tell the folks who came after them. We follow Jesus because Jesus literally defeated death, hell, and the grave. That is our foundation. So guess what? When you're going through death-like situations, I rest on the foundation. When I'm going through hellish situations, I rest on this foundation. When I'm going through the grave season of my life, I rest on this foundation. Why? Because I have evidence that this Jesus has the power to raise inanimate things to life. And, you know, I, I just think it's always worth saying that this is what caused them to have such faith and boldness against the onslaught of the death dealing empire of their day. It was not their deep doctrine of the Trinity that made the Roman Empire take notice of this small emerging group of followers of Jesus. It was the way they endured trouble, conflict. It was the way they loved on one another with such extravagance that the people who were not believers looked at them and said, they called them all kind of pejorative names in the beginning. They said, you know, when they would come together to eat the body and the blood of Jesus, you know what they started to call them? Cannibalists. These people, they eat human blood, human flesh. They're cannibals. When they would come into their meetings and they were telling everybody they loved one another and they were referring to each other as brothers and sisters. They clearly were not related. They began to call them folks who were engaging in orgies and all these crazy love life feasts. Why? Because the way they lived with one another, listen, made such little sense to them that the words they had could not fully express the life that they were observing them to live. I just wonder what has the church lost in the American context today? Whereby no one can really look at the way we live with each other and, and, and have this countercultural dissonance around our quality and way of life. As I listen to folks respond to the shootings and all the top topics of the day, it makes me think about our foundation. Is our foundation sure? We live as living stones amidst the rubble if we have a foundation, but listen, we also live as living stones of Mr. Rubble, if we have a life-giving framework. Foundations, but you also must have a framework. What is a framework? A framework is that which orders your life. The foundation is that which holds your life, but you and I must have a framework that can help order our lives. Some of our frameworks are handed to us by our country of origin, our cultural sensibilities, our political ideology. 
the traditions of our faith and church and theological assumptions. But I want you to know that in and of themselves, none of those things are a problem, but they all deserve interrogation. Our framework, that which orders our life, should always produce the same results of the foundation that holds our life. Am I making sense to y'all this morning? I feel like maybe I'm, 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 I'm living in my head a little bit in this sermon. The framework that orders your life, that which helps you produce whatever you produce, must always be reflective of that which is holding your life. How can you say I'm being held by the Jesus who is a peacemaker and my framework is violence? How can I say that I'm being held by the Jesus who literally hangs out with the unhoused and my framework is to build benches with spikes on them. So people who have fallen on such hard times that they can't live inside will be uncomfortable sleeping on a bench. That is public property. I mean, it ain't like the bench is your bench. <laughs> Praise God. It's like, you know, you sleeping on my bench. It's not your bench. It's the public's bench. I mean, we had unhoused Ten City that popped up here and you know uh the the response was to 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 to, to call the police and, and and cast them all out and you know i said well there are you know no better places in the city to build a tent city than on the side of a church so for a couple weeks you know we cooked up big pots of spaghetti and you know, try to be a best ministry to the folks as we could because we realized that it was a temporary solution to a permanent problem. And yet we have people in power who claim to follow Jesus or follow some kind of moral code. And yet when it comes to our unhoused loved ones, our ideology is about us rather than all of us. Our framework, if it's too capitalistic, your framework is insufficient to be a living stone amidst the rubble. If it's too racialized, it's insufficient. If it's too driven by class, it's insufficient. If it's too driven by gender or race or identity, it's insufficient. Our framework must be wholly informed by the foundation on which we stand. And how many of you know that the foundation on which we stand is big enough to hold everything I just said? My hope and prayer for us who follow Jesus is that we will not become consumed by our frameworks that we reject our foundation. Because a living stone will turn back to a dead stone if it loses its foundation. You may have all the great frameworks in the world, but I do believe that there's something life-giving about flowing from the eternal wisdom and knowledge of the Creator. How many of you know everything that we've thought of, every knowledge we have, every bit of wisdom we have, it is time-bound? Hello, somebody. It's time bound, which means that it's only the best wisdom until it's not. <laughs> Hello, somebody. I, 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 there are things when I was growing up that I knew for sure was true until I got older. And then it's like, man, all the best wisdom and knowledge I had did not outlast the time of my life. Which is then leads me to my last point. Living stones amidst the rubble means that faithfulness. Everybody say faithfulness. Faithfulness then is the actual manifestation 
of what it means to, as the scripture says, live as chosen people. You and I living as chosen people then is a nod to this truth that you are not your own. That we belong to God. God chose us. God literally picked you. God saw intrinsic value in you. God saw something in you that was not disqualifying. God's cho choosing you does not have an expiration date on it. That for the whole of your life, we are God's chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. What does that mean? It means that you are called to do and be a representative of God wherever you are. God chose you to be a priesthood, to intercede, to stand in the gap, to be a representative, to bring spiritual power and vitality into everywhere we go. God chose us to be a priest. Hood to it to, to, to literally offer sacrifices of praise and, and 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 admonition to point people in the direction of God. And listen, the final thing it says you must be faithful that you are a holy nation, meaning that God has a nation inside of a nation. To be a holy nation means that God has set you apart inside of the current context. God wants you to be reminded that even though you live amidst the rubble, God has set you apart inside the rubble. God has given you a special carve out, a special anointing, a special function, a special purpose amidst the rubble. And I want us to be people who see ourselves as lively stones amidst the rubble with a sense of purpose with a sense of calling, with a sense of power. I, I know that I may be surrounded by death and hell and the grave, but God has purposed me to be in this moment and situation because there's still some glory that God intends to get out of my life and out of this situation. It does not negate that the trouble is there. It does not negate that despair and, and doubt and hopelessness lingers around. Uh, but what it does remind me is that I am alive uh, through the power of the living God. Do I have anybody that can appreciate that? Even though you may be going through, you are still alive. I'm alive by the power of God. I'm alive by the love of God. I'm alive by the faithfulness of God. I'm alive because God keeps blowing inside me something that the devil can't snuff out. I'm alive because God keeps causing me to stand in the middle of all the trouble I have to face. I'm alive because there's something that God is working out. There's some purpose that God is achieving. Uh, there's some work that God is doing uh, and if I can just be patient with myself uh, and give God the space to move uh, then I believe that if God keeps working on me the rough edges will become smooth uh, if God keeps working on me uh, those low places will become elevated uh, if God keeps working on me uh, those places of emptiness uh, those places of lack those places of weakness will become the strength that is infused by the power of the living God I am alive because God's power is alive I am alive because God's victory is alive I am alive because God's purpose is alive I am alive because God's not through with me yet and you ought to be happy that you are around me because if God is alive in me then that means God is alive in you bye bye death bye bye hell bye bye grave it's resurrection time
life because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us. Somebody shout hallelujah. Lively stones amidst the rubble. The rubble may be your family. You ought to say I'm alive. The rubble may be your job. You ought to say, I'm alive. The rubble may be your neighborhood. You ought to say, I'm alive. And because I'm alive, then God is always at work in us. Stay with me. Come on. We're going to take a few moments to pray. Hallelujah. Grab the hand of someone. Or touch them with love. And let's just pray for God to be alive in them. For God to turn their inanimate places into living stones. For God to turn their dead places into dynamic and vibrant soil. Squeeze their hand real gently. God, I squeeze into these hands life, resurrection, hope, strength. I command the stones of their lives to be alive. I command the lively stones to be structured and ordered in alignment with the chief cornerstone that is our foundation. I rebuke death. I rebuke despair. I rebuke, oh God, the forces of wickedness and evil that are seeking to penetrate their lively stones. I pray, God, that you will breathe life into them today. Wherever they are, if it's sickness in the bodies of them or their loved ones, breathe life. And cause them to see, God, that it is how we are going through that brings life and glory to your name. I pray, God, if it is relationships, if it is our vocation, our jobs, our careers, if it is the personal habits and struggles we deal with, I pray life will be breathed into us so we become more than inanimate stones. We want to be lively stones. We want to be stones that are exuding life so do it for my brother, my sister, my loved one I'm touching. Do it for them right now. Now lift those hands where you are. It's me, oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father. It's not my sister. It's not my brother. But I need you, Lord. I need you to infuse me with life. I need you, God, to fill some gaps. I need you to make up some differences. I need you, God, to help me over this rough patch. I need you to remind me, God, that I am a part of your spiritual project. And I know that you have purpose that is greater than my pain. You have power that is greater than my weakness. And so I receive it today. Somebody say, I receive power. I receive purpose. I receive healing. I receive salvation. I receive hope. I receive love, I receive joy, I receive the materials that make up this spiritual house. May it be abundant in me. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them you are alive today. You are a living.